In this video, I'm going to work with this question. I will solve the first and the third part in this video. And for the part number two, I will upload a separate video. Okay, let's get started with the first part. A researcher computes Jack Berra statistic for a large sample as 7.378. Does it provide evidence in favor of normality of the error term? Use 5% level of significance. Now this question is quite simple. Before I show you the right answer, let's first note a couple of points about Jack Berra test. As you can see in the image over here, the Jack Berra test is a test of normality. The normality of what? The normality of the population error term. This is an asymptotic or large sample test. That means this test gives good results if you're working with a large sample, which we are in this particular case. The formula that we have to find the test statistic is this where n is the sample size, s represents skewness, and k represents kurtosis. In this question, you don't have to worry about this formula because they have already given you the value of the test statistic. But if you encounter a question in which you are not given the value directly, then this is the formula that you have to use. And now because you are already given the calculated value, all you have to do is figure out the critical value and then compare the calculated and the critical value. Now let's see what is it that they have written about the critical value. They have shown that under the normality assumption, the JB statistic given in equation number 3.47, that is this, follows the chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom asymptotically, that is in large samples. So this means to find the critical value, you have to take a look at the chi-square table and you have to look for two degrees of freedom. Okay, now let's start writing the solution. So in this case, the null hypothesis is going to be that the population errors are normally distributed. So your null hypothesis is that population errors are normally distributed. Note that I have written population error because we are talking about the test of normality of the population error term. And the alternate hypothesis is going to be that your population errors are not normally distributed. So population errors are not normally distributed. Okay, now we are already given the calculated value. So let's just talk about the critical value. For the critical value, we have to find the value of chi square at two degrees of freedom. So to visualize this, take a look at this distribution that I'm drawing over here. So this is a general chi square distribution that I've drawn over here. This is not specific to any particular degrees of freedom. For example, for two degrees of freedom, this will not be the shape of the chi square. This is just the general shape that I've drawn to make you visualize what is it that you have to find. So we are given that we have to test for 5% level of significance. So for the critical value, you have to find that value of chi square to the right of which you have 5% area. That means the probability is 0 0.05. So you have to find this particular value and you can easily find it from the chi square table. You are already given that the degrees of freedom is equal to two. Now see, I'm not going to show you how to take a look at the chi-square table in this video, as I have already explained that in some other video. If you're not that comfortable with the chi-square table, then you should check the description of this video. I'm putting a link of the video in which I have explained how to take a look at the chi-square table. So you can learn how to take a look at the chi-square table from that particular video, okay? So if you take a look at the chi-square table, you will see that this value over here is 5.991. So this is the critical value that you're going to find from the table for two degrees of freedom at 5% level of significance. And now the answer is quite straightforward because the critical value is 5.991. Your test statistic is 7.378. That means the test statistic is somewhere to the right of the critical value in the rejection region. So in this case, we are going to reject the null hypothesis because the calculated value is greater than the critical value. That means the population errors are not normally distributed. Okay, so that's it for this part. Let's move to the next part now. We are given this information and we have to obtain the OLS estimators of beta 1 and beta 2 for the two variable model that is this model. So first of all, let me clear the notations over here. I'm going to call the estimator of beta 1 as b1 and I'm going to call the OLS estimator of beta two as B2. So these are the notations of the estimators that I'm going to use. Now, if you know your formulas well, 
then you should know that b1 is equal to y bar minus b2 x bar and b2 is equal to summation of xi minus x bar multiplied with yi minus y bar divided by summation of xi minus x bar whole square. And you have to find the value of b1 and b2 given this information over here. Now note that before you could find b1, you need to find b2 because the formula for b1 has b2 over here. So let's talk about b2 first. Now note that there are various formulas to calculate the value of b2. Generally speaking, many students remember this formula, but in this case, you cannot use this formula directly because the information that's given to you is not in this particular manner. So they have not given you the value of the denominator directly or they have not given you the value of the numerator directly. So what we are going to do is that we are not going to work with this formula. We are going to work with the other formula that we have for B2. So the other formula that we have for B2 is this one and the denominator is summation of xi square minus n x bar square. Now see, I'm not going to explain you in this video that from where do we get this formula or how do we go from here to here as I've already covered this in detail in a separate video. So once again, I'm putting the link of that video in the description of this video. If you want to understand the different formulas that we have to calculate the value of B2, then do check the description of this video and take a look at the link that I have shared. Okay, so assuming that you're okay with this formula, let's proceed further. So first of all, I'm going to find the value of B2. So B2 is equal to, the first term over here is summation of xy. You are directly given the value of that. It's 411000. So this is 411000 minus n is 10. Then you have x bar and y bar. You're not given the value of x bar and y bar directly, but it's quite simple to find. We know that x bar is equal to summation of xi over n. And we are given that summation of x is equal to 3400. So this is 3400 divided by 10 because n is equal to 10. So this is 340. Similarly, y bar is equal to summation of y i over n. We are given that summation of y is triple to zero. So this is equal to triple to zero divided by 10. And this is triple two. So x bar is 340, y bar is triple two. We can put over here the value of x bar. We can put over here the value of y bar. So this is your numerator and in the denominator, the first term is summation of xi square, which is this. So six double four triple zero and the second term is n x bar square. So n and the square of x bar, so 340 square. And if you solve this, you will get that B2 is equal to 0 0.6714. So B2 is equal to this. Now, once you know the value of B2, it's quite simple to find the value of B1. B1 is equal to Y bar minus B2 X bar. I already know that Y bar is 222. So 222 minus 0 0.6714 multiplied with X bar, that is 340. And if you solve this, you will get that B1 is equal to minus 6.276. And that's it. This question was quite straightforward. The only thing that you have to be careful about is which formula of B2 you have to use. So in this question, the information was given in such a manner that using this particular formula makes sense. And this is the reason you should be familiar with different formulas to calculate B2 because they can give you information in such a manner that using one particular formula will save you a lot of time in the exam. Okay. So with this, we are done with the first and third part of this question. I will discuss the second part of this question in my next video.